Okay, there's still a few to come, but uh, in the interests of um, our uh, and your time, um, let's um, get going. Um, there's enough of us to, or yeah, there's there's enough of us to to go around and uh, and and do um, introductions rather than needing to do it um, yes. online in some. Um, uh, funny way. Um, so, um, so yeah, I'm Tim Rivet, and um, I run Artig, um, and I'm your compare for today. Um, <laughs> but um, Rob West um, will be uh, doing most of the heavy lifting for us today. Rob, morning. Yeah. Um, so I know some people here but perhaps not some of the others um i've i've been brought in to actually draft the um specification that we're talking about today so um if you've read through the documentation you'll have seen some of my handiwork there already um my background is very much in um software engineering interface um specifications and development as well um and i've been working um, in public transport industry for the best part of 20 years now um although not specifically in um, real-time information for all that time. I've been doing a lot of scheduling and uh, other types of um, public transport stuff as well. So yes, very much a, a technical person. Okay, thank you, Rob. Um, okay, so um, just to um, make sure everybody's up to speed, um, we are um, doing this bit of work um, as Artig. Um, at the request of Transport for Wales, um, because they are looking to um, go out to procurement um, in the coming months for um, real-time systems and data management systems. One bit of that um, is um, a content management system to enable um, the electronic displays that are scattered around Wales to be um, driven in a more consistent manner. Um, yeah, I'm sure that those of you that have been involved in, in large scale rollouts before um, that have taken a while, you end up in a situation where you have multiple display suppliers if you want to put a message on a display, then you end up having two or three or more places to put that message, um, depending on the display that's at a given stop. Um, well, um, Wales, along with a number of other people, um, such as Derbyshire, Nottinghamshire, um, South Yorkshire have talked about it, West Yorkshire have talked about it, West Midlands are talking about it, um, London is interested. Actually, how can we get to the point where um, we can have a central CMS that we can put in place um, that takes all of the different feeds um, and supplies all of the displays, um, whoever they come from, um, across a network. Um, and there is one point that you can put in messages and, and things like that. Um, so the aspiration is to develop something that will enable a content management system to consistently supply data um, to a range of different suppliers displays, depending on what's around in a, in a particular um, authority or areas um, asset set. Um, and so we are... Um, setting out to try and um, get the uh, a, a initial um, interface designed and um, available so that um, we can start to move down that path towards getting a single place where we can um, put messages and, and content and it will appear on the relevant screens without worrying about who those screens are. 
Um, so we've had a number of um, sessions um, so far covering the broad principles, um, looking at what are the things that people think that we absolutely have to have um, in this interface. Um, and we're now at the point where that um, those initial discussions um, and ideas are starting to be turned into something a bit more practical. Um, what might this interface actually look like? Um, and at the moment, most of the focus has been on the principles of that um, that interface. Um, and you should have um, had um, links to that interface document um, in its very draft form. Um, and today we're really wanting to explore um, that, make sure that um, that's going in the right sort of direction and then start to look at actually. So once we've got that interface, what are the messages? What's the data that a display needs to meet some basic criteria? Um, and um, we are using three type concept of, of three display types. So um, at the most simplistic level, a basic text based display. Um, if you think about a, a, a three line um, LED display, um, that's along the right sort of lines. Um, it can't do much more than um, display text. So you might have a service number and a destination and, and either the scheduled time or the predicted time. Um, you might be able to put a message on it, but you're limited um, in the content that that can display to um, pretty much uh, alphanumeric characters, really. Um, and so we're starting off with a, we need the interface to be able to support um, that sort of information that you would put onto a text based display. Um, because the other types of display build on that. So you then move to actually if you've got a TFT, um, a graphical display of some sort that might be able to display more than just um, you know, alphanumeric characters, it might be able to display some some basic graphics or, or full color moving images um, at, at the far level. So then you move on from actually, so it's displaying the textual information. Um, what do we need in the interface to be able to um, allow a level of management um, for the more graphical content? Um, and, and how do we support that and add on to that? And then the third type of display um, are um, what we're calling off-grid displays. It seems to be um, um, getting some traction this. So you might think of that as a low power display, uh, a solar display, something that may not be connected to um, permanent power. And so he's having to do clever things to make sure that the battery doesn't run out um, or power levels don't get over a particular level. Um, might be e-ink, might be um, LED or, or TFT, but you know it's got constraints that means that um, you probably want um, to uh, to manage that in a slightly different way um, through a management interface, CMS type type arrangement um, to make sure that that power is properly controlled. They also might not have permanent. Um, um, internet connections or network connections. So, you know, it might be something that somebody has to plug in every day to pick up the latest timetable or something like that. Um, or once a week, it, it collects the timetable. Um, so a more specialist type of display, but with some sort of common characteristics. So those are the three sort of displays that we're um, trying to um, support at the moment. 
the focus is very much on um, basic text displays. How do we get the information that's necessary for those? But with an eye to to, to the other two um, at the moment to make sure we don't do anything that's um, too prejudicial to to what we would want to do next. Um, any questions? Hopefully for those of you that have been involved in some of these before that, there's nothing new in that. No, no. no it made sense to me. Yeah, OK, in which case, um, where's my um, outline gone? Um, we are um, going to then um, jump into um, the the detail of today. So today um, we're going to go through um, the content, the key bits of content that are in the document that's been shared. Make sure that um, you're comfortable with that um and refine it where necessary following your feedback and comments mustafa uh just a quick one you you in your uh intro uh, uh around what you're going to do today you mentioned a draft spec has been developed I, has that been shared uh because i don't think i've seen it yet ah okay um right yes it, it has been it was shared earlier this week to um to RT mailing lists and things like that. Um I will once once Rob um started to talk about the governing principles and things like that, I'll make sure you get a link to it in the next couple of minutes. Okay, um, thank you. Yeah. So um Tim. Yes. Could you just so me as well? Because I only joined yesterday, only only booked up yesterday. Um yeah, he, he went out as a bulk gartig. All oh, right, okay, so I'll find it. No problem. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, so um, one of the first bits in the document is what are the governing principles that we're working on? And Rob, do you want to pick up from here? Yes, absolutely. That's fine. Um, so yeah, I mean that's you know in um, simple terms, we've got these three principles. Um, and I've been bearing those in mind as I've been um, doing the draft document. Um, I mean, it's 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 quite clear what's written there: abstraction, clarity, simplicity. And and really, I think you can sort of summarise um, all of those three together by just saying, well, we want to keep it simple. We don't want this to expand into a three hundred page document um, that somebody then takes away and tries to implement as a. Um, as an interface, and then you end up with um, different flavours where different people have discovered different, um, let's say, loopholes in a specification that suit them better than uh, perhaps a, a different way of doing something. So I really, really just want to try and nail down the absolute key principles of what we're trying to do and keep it as simple as possible. Um, I appreciate that as this unfolds and as we develop the specification, there will be complexities that need to be unpacked. Um, we will need to make it more complicated than we had initially hoped. I'm sure that will happen. Um, but by putting these right at the top of the document and by talking about them right now at the top of the meeting here, um, I just want everyone to sort of keep that in mind that where possible, if we can build on um, stuff that's out there already, um, we should do that if we can eliminate these grey areas that always seem to creep into specifications. We should try to do that. Um, and if we can edit the document and strip out 10 pages of waffle, we should do that too and just keep it really down to the, the bare minimum. Um, so that, that's that's really it. Um, I mean, if anyone has any comments on that, please do jump in and, and, and you know, feedback and, and tell me I've missed the point or tell me that I've missed something. Um, bef before I uh, continue on down this path, um, but that's really the uh, the key to it. Um, uh, Mustafa, I can see a hand up. I don't know if that's a, a legacy hand or. or no, no it's just so overall the principles are, you know, they, they sound good. I think just from the clarity 
rather than grey areas should be minimised. I, I think should they should be eliminated because any time you have grey areas, um, that impacts uh, interoperability, especially if you're going to have a, a single back office working with multiple uh, display vendors. And you know, if one display vendor goes in one direction for their grey area and another one goes in another direction for their grey area, you know, what, what does the CMS do? Absolutely. I'm quite happy with that. I think in one of the uh, the very early drafts, I, I had eliminated written in there and then I watered it down a little bit because I didn't want to upset too many people. <laughs> but uh, that's that's great. Oh, I can see another hand up. Um, Patrick, I think. Patrick. Yeah, so, so I guess apologies for sort of joining in on all these discussions sort of a little bit after they're, they're, they're well underway. But um, I guess in terms of the grey and we'll maybe come on to this more on the, on the technical side of things. But obviously, I, I, I guess there are but the principle for this is interoperability and the ability that you can sort of, to a degree, and I don't want to use the word in the negative sense, commoditize um, suppliers and, and, and interchange between them, which over 20 years ago, we started trying to do this and came up with things like Trans Exchange and Siri, because there were 120 standards that was it Chris Chambers found or something, I can't remember anyway. Um, but the, the, as you say, there will be subtle nuances and, and differences further down the line. And I just wondered whether the, the principle of this, because obviously it, it's a, about a content management system and that's kind of about what's in the envelope and what's moved around the place rather than necessarily dictating that a centralized system supplied presumably by one vendor will directly talk to lots and lots of screens over the airwaves for want of a phrase. Is there a principle where you insert some sort of peer-to-peer web-to-web communication protocols to pass content to for example trapeze or um, journey or to Nexus Alpha Low Power System screens rather than your central system having to actually do that end communication. I just wondered whether that was something you discussed because certainly the document sort of starts to move into the how to communicate directly whereas if you had a server to server link with a very tightly defined CMS and exchange of data that would still meet I think TFW and other people's requirements. In other words you could plug anything you need into it but it would stop potentially every single display vendor having to change every single bit of code and every single display and build around a CMS. So I just I wondered whether you'd explored that or not in terms of the scope of the project. Tim, can I just ask you to comment on that? Um, if that's all right, I saw you nodding there. Yes, so, so we have Patrick, um, and that's one of the reasons why um, we've got, for example, those off-grid um, display categories where actually, you know, that interface to the display needs to be managed really tightly to manage power and things like that. The, the concept of a gateway um, type arrangement um, does exist. And, uh, and when we get to the architecture um, bit, there are uh, th th there is a diagram um, that, that shows that. Right. Um, exact arrangement because yeah you're right there may well be cases where something needs to be a bit too specialized or legacy systems um needs to be integrated fine sounds good okay thank you for letting me play catch up thanks tim okay um do we have any more comments on these principles um or should we uh should we move on to the um is it scope that's next, I think, isn't it? Yep. So again, this um, what we're seeing on the screen now is, is essentially just extracted directly from uh, what's in the document. If you've had a chance to um, to read through that, this is really um, the scope as it currently stands. Um, and so this top one is important so far. The drafted document that you've that you've had circulated is really focusing on these very simple text-based displays, um, and that's primarily what's being considered in in the document as it stands. The um, the more graphical and the off-grid displays, the lower power displays, obviously will come later and will be sort of it will build on what we've already got for the text-based display. So please don't read this as it's only text-based displays that are ever going to be in scope. That's that's not the intention. Um, so uh, once once that's cleared up, um, let me just go down the list here. So communications infrastructure, that's 
I suppose needs a little bit of, of clearing up. I'm not talking about the low level infrastructure here. That's taken as red. That's that's back to the governing principle of abstraction. I'm not interested in the low level network communications here. Um, it's more just about is it an IP network or not? Um, that that sort of level and then the application that's built on top of that. Um, multi vendor support, obviously key to the whole thing. Um, a discovery process. We we can talk a little bit more in detail about this perhaps later if, if required, um, but that is very much in scope of what we're trying to do. This concept of, to use the 1990s phrase, plug and play, um, where you can um, rock up to a location, a bus stop, a, a station platform, um, and you can install a display without then having to pull the back off it and plug wires into it and commission it on the spot there. Um, ideally, this discovery process is based on each display device having a unique ID and then once it connects to the network, it announces its presence and the whole process kicks off automatically um, so that the configuration then is all done from the CMS side in the software, in the database, um, and you don't have to be um, mucking about with them um, with commissioning on site and um, so that's what that's all about um within scope also security requirements for anything that's on the public internet now this we'll, we'll get to the uh, the network diagrams perhaps uh, in a few minutes time um but it's very much assumed that there will be parts of the system on the public internet because we've got different vendors we've got to have communications across different servers between servers and then some signs may indeed actually be connected directly to the internet as well but at the same time there will be parts of the um the network that are private and um, there might be private apns there might be vpns between different systems um, however it might be um structured and within scope is the security for everything that's on the public internet and then out of scope is things that are on private networks. I'm not considering that as part of the specification here. That's really an implementation detail, perhaps for each vendor if they're using a private network or for each existing legacy system. Um, I don't think this document should be concerned with trying to impose additional security layers on something that's already in place, um, but it does need to cover security for anything that's on the public internet. So that's what that's about. Um, and then the um, the actual nitty gritty stuff, the specification of the message structures and the content. Um, what is the information we need to shift from the CMS onto the displays? Um, things like timetable departure times, estimated departure times, and then crucially, of course, the um, departure clear downs. Um, you know, the, perhaps the most important part um, of the whole thing. So all of that is very much in scope. Um, and then at the bottom there, and um, what we've called heartbeat messaging and general thought reporting, that really is a, a key part of this. You know, we, we really need this system, you know, multi-vendor, lots of different signs, one CMS, possibly even other devices also on the same network sharing information. Um, we need to know that these devices still exist, are still alive. Um, and if there's a problem, we need to be able to capture what the faults are and then do something about them. Um, so all of that is very much in scope. Um, so I don't know if we can move across to the um, out of scope um, section. Thank you. Um, so yes, as I mentioned before, um, the, the network security within the private networks, which could be existing legacy stuff, or it, it could be um something that comes along in future there, there may be a requirement that um, a particular vendor's signs are connected to their own vpn their own private apm whatever it might be and that's not the concern of what we're trying to do here there will be a gateway to that um and the gateway will be specified if you like by, by the specification how the communication is to be transferred what the um the latency requirements are all these sorts of things for interoperating between the different networks but once you're into the private network then that's not the concern of this specification anymore um so direct integration of legacy or low power devices so it's it's sort of the same thing 
Um, yes, of course, we're going to be considering low power devices. That's a, a key part of what we're trying to do. It's not in the current um, document. Um, it will be in a future revision, um, but it's these keywords, direct integration. Um, that's the key there. Um, where we've got legacy or low power devices, it is assumed that there will be some kind of um, vendor provided gateway device that is controlling um, the communication to those devices, bearing in mind that they might not be connected to, to the network or to, to any kind of power source all the time. And so there will need to be that extra layer um, in there provided by the by the vendor. Um, so that's that. Um, time synchronization, of course, this is really important because it's all very well sending a message to a display with an estimated arrival time or departure time, um, whatever it might be. Um, but if these devices aren't synchronized, then it makes counting down to that departure tricky. Um, however, even saying that time synchronization is not in scope of what we're doing here. It is assumed that each sign device will have its own way of synchronizing, whether that's NTP um, or some other kind of mechanism provided by a gateway device. Um, my, I think I'm, I'm anticipating that when there's a project that uses this specification, part of the project will, one of the requirements of the project will define, you know, what is the maximum drift that is permitted um, before you fail a KPI. You know, that, that, that's the sort of thing. So it, it's left really as an implementation detail of the project. Um, and it's assumed that these devices will be synchronized and it's not the responsibility of this specification to include um, special packets of data for trying to synchronize time. Um, and then at the bottom here, hardware specification. There is no desire, there's no wish to specify at a detailed level what the hardware spec should be. Um, that is entirely up to the, um, the manufacturers, the vendors of the devices. Um, we're not trying to get in the way of that at all. We don't want to stifle the innovation there. Um, you know, that, that's entirely out of scope of what we're trying to do. Excellent, thank you. So I think architecture's um, probably next. Just before we move on, are there any comments on in scope, out of scope, um, anything that perhaps has been missed, anything that should move from one category to the other, um, or any general comments on that? Just to part of my, to ask my ask question my after you've done um, that. Yeah, I've got one. Um, on the time sink, uh, given having looked at the spec, um, it would seem to be rather easy to have something pr pr something on the network providing a time sink. Is that I'm not sure I'm not sure why you precluded that. Is that is there a, a reason why you thought that would be a problem? Um, not specifically. It was it's sort of back to this original principle of not reinventing the wheel. Um, okay. so if, if, if there's already a perfectly good time service on on the internet or you know some other means of doing it why do we want to spend time specifying something in addition um that requires then everybody to implement something new over and above what they might already have um if that's a wrong assumption um then absolutely um maybe we should uh, we should include it um i don't think anyone else has any comments about <coughs> that but um that that's yeah, very much exactly the uh, the point of today to discuss that, things like this. From a device's perspective, if it's got a connection to um, uh, the, the network that we've that's been provided here, it might be easier to get time from there than to than to get it from a, a separate source. Um, just a comment, it's fine. Okay. Thank you. I'll, I'll perhaps think a bit harder about whether we need to to do more there. I think um, at the back of my mind, I've assumed that there is internet connectivity here um, at some level, and therefore it should be possible to connect to standard NTP type services. Um, that may not be the correct assumption. I, I don't know. Um, that is something perhaps to consider. I mean, there, there are within um, 
some of the public transport standards for on vehicle um sen approaches to um providing consistent time on a vehicles network so you have a a source that everything can consume from um, that is of course based on ntp um so um at a minimum um we can reference that and say you know if you need a time service then this is the implementation that you should use because particularly if you you know one of the things that we've not particularly talked about is on bus displays if you're going to stick a display <laughs> on a bus to provide next stop announcements advertising or whatever then actually those would could assume that there is a time service on on the vehicle because there is the send standard um for that and so um we could perhaps reference that um but it's something to to talk to some more um display manufacturers and suppliers about i guess as well yes i suppose as a starting point i mean it... I don't know whether we've got the right people on the call today, but if you know if if we've got vendors here who have got signs out there um, in in the real world, how how are they currently um, ensuring that their yeah. clocks are synchronised? Uh, are they just using NTP, or or are there other sort of systems in existence? Are there is is it specific to each implementation? Um, would you expect to have to implement some kind of time synchronisation on every project? I mean, it, it seems a little bit of an odd way to do it to me, but but then I'm not a sign manufacturer. I don't know the uh, the nuances of the uh, of the implementations. Michael. Yeah, um, I mean, it's probably uh, a legacy thing now, but I do remember we occasionally had problems with the actual provider of the data with their their, their um, servers drifting on time. But I, I'm sure that must be something that's pretty rare these days. You occasionally had to ring up the company and say, could you reset your clock, you know, because you, you're out by about three minutes or something like that. So it did used to happen, but I don't think it would happen these days. I'm sure that would be something that could be easily uh, is already done to make sure it's mm -hmm. synchronised. Patrick, you're on mute. One strike and out. Um, yeah, you, you, you build into it and that's the way. You build into your server some synchronization then obviously every bit of communication that goes through to your signs you then have the opportunity to sort of check times and things but certainly you know you, you, you'd centrally sync it um i was interested about what you tim said there about you know on on bus you're know, moving displays as well and, and ultimately whether you're going to sort of increase the scope for that because there are obviously different requirements there um to, to some extent certainly in terms of the type of content that you might want on there because there might be you know location based content rather than just you know things that you want to say at a particular time you might want to say something at a particular place so that you know that sounds like horrendous scope creep to me at this stage but it's an interesting point that, that tim made there yeah the time yes. i think i think um yeah it, 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 and what mike, mike was saying as well i think that if you if you are locking down the communications potentially as part of this cms mm. it would be appropriate even if the, the event doesn't necessarily make use of it that you provide a time sync service as, as as part of the solution so you kind of don't have to go and look somewhere else or open up other connections onto the, to the public internet or something i think that would make sense yeah okay i mean no and i'm sort of considering just on the fly as it were um you know if, if you've already got heartbeat messaging going on and if the cms is part of that and it's issuing a heartbeat message anyway um then having a timestamp on that almost solves the problem yeah. um and then everyone follows the the time of the cms um and then it's up to the cms to make sure it's actually got the correct time in terms of the sort of bigger picture um so certainly that's something that can be um that's something that we can add in yeah excellent thank you so anything else on scope No. Okay. Architecture then. Okay, dokie. 
Oh, right. What do you want to? How do you want to deal with this, Rob? Um, I think let's. I don't know. I think people hopefully can see both of those diagrams on the screen at the same time. Just about. Um, they're essentially two two views of the same thing. Um, so the one on the left is the the very simplified view. Um, the the sort of top level um, concept. Um, I'll just start from the left because um, that's uh, traditional. Um, so there's a prediction engine in there, and that's the only time you'll really see a prediction engine mentioned um, anywhere in the specification, I think. And it's really that just there to to sort of highlight the fact that the, the concept that we've got is that the prediction engine or possibly engines, um, they're sort of out of scope. Maybe we need to specify that they're out of scope directly. Um, they are feeding data, prediction data into the content management system. And the content management system is then responsible for all communication with the displays. So the prediction engine is just there in that picture to, to sort of signify that it's quite far removed from the displays themselves. It is only supplying data to the CMS and then the bit that we're interested in is from the CMS to the displays. And then there's this big bubble in the middle which just says MQTT. Now, hopefully those who have been on the uh, previous meetings will um, have been pre-warned about this um, MQTT and that that's the sort of thing that we're thinking of. This is a, um, I think it's disappeared off the screen there, a sort of um, a pub sub model, uh, publish and subscribe. Um, and message broker is is what you can see in the middle there, the uh, the light blue MQTT broker. Now, I don't know whether now's the time and place to spend a long time discussing the technology there. Um, there are quite a lot of words about it in the document, you know, if you've had a chance to read that. And I'm hoping that a lot of people on the call will already have a, a, a reasonable understanding of what we're talking about here. Um, but I'm, if somebody wants to ask me a question or, or ask for a fuller explanation, then I'm happy to to do that if it's needed. So where do we stand on that? Does, does anyone need more description of what PubSub or Message Broker mean? Um, um, I don't need description. I'm just going <clears> to <throat> say that let, let's say um, Transport for Wales as a scenario. Are we assuming that Transports for Wales would provide the um, message broker centrally. I've got a uh, uh, Mustafa with a hand up, so I think he's ideally placed to answer that question. <laughs> yeah, so um, I mean, ideally, uh, we would probably put that as part of the uh, CMS requirement. So if we go out to procurement, um, you know, we've already got requirements around providing a outbound interface to displays. Um, and if that happens to be using an MQTT broker, then that would be the way to deliver it. So we, we may uh, refine our requirements based on you know the, the work going on here. Uh, so rather than say you must develop an interface that does X, Y, and Z, you say, well, yes, you do have to develop an interface uh, to Arctic standard and provide an MQTT uh, to your broker server as part of the service. Okay. All right. But, but, but once your supplier is identified, there will be one MQTT broker that would be publicised as being uh, the one that other services need to connect to. Yeah, I think, I think that, that's where we would, we would most yeah. likely be headed. Uh, yeah. No point us buying multiple of those or... No, 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 I understand. I'm just, yeah, just, just nailing that down. So, OK, fine. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, one important point here, um, the, which may not be immediately obvious, and I'm not sure if it is described very clearly in the document yet, um, is that these things are very much standardised and there are plenty of, for example, open source implementations of MQTT brokers. So we're not saying this is suddenly a very expensive piece of kit that, that needs to be specified as part of the project. Um, th this is a, <clears throat> almost certainly an open source piece of software um, obviously, it needs hosting costs, it needs thinking about as part of the implementation, um, but it's not something that needs to be custom written. It's an off the shelf piece of broker software. And you can just see some very small writing appearing there. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm just putting a, a note on that. Uh, actually, we need to. That's provided by the CMS. Yes, I think that make that, that would make sense. Um, that, that those belong together, if you like. Um, Patrick, I can see your hands come up. Yeah, just in terms of the sort of the the legacy systems and the the sort of the gateway, mm -hmm. would you envisage that? Therefore, sort of obviously on the right hand diagram, you've got sort of vendor specific services, but that's shown as being kind of breaking off communication between the MOT and the um, connected computers, the connected displays. Whereas I think you you kind of need another dark blue box sort of to the right of the of the MOT. Uh, would you be talking about still using sorry, MQTT? Would you still be talking about using MQTT as the method for communicating with the gateway? Because then you'd have a standard interface for everything. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So if we move over to the um, the the diagram on the right, um, and perhaps zoom in a little bit on it. Thanks, Tim. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I've I've put three examples here: supplier A, supplier B, supplier C. Um, and really, it's it's sort of architecture A, architecture B, and architecture C, and all of them would be interoperable. That's the the idea. So this supplier A in this example um, is using legacy PIDs, and I guess that that would also apply potentially to low power things in the future same sort of um, architecture there um, so there has to be a proprietary interface there i mean if it's a legacy system it might be some kind of weird binary format that you need to convert the data into um, and if it's a future low power system there might be magic that you have to perform that only the supplier can perform to make that work um, and so then you've got this funny little cloud shaped icon, which um, is just labeled MQTT bridge to private APN. Um, I suppose it might not even be a private APN, but that's a sort of separate issue in a way. Um, the point is that it's an MQTT bridge. Um, so the concept really is then that the, the signals, the, the messages are coming in from the main broker and they're being translated in some way and it's bi-directional so then that bridge is also having to then speak fluent mqtt back to the to the central um, broker as well and because of the uh, the joy of how these things work um none of the other devices on the network need to know what's going on it's completely transparent to them it's it's just another device on the network um so that that's that's supplier a there that's that's that setup Supplier B in, in the diagram is a completely different architecture entirely. Um, and so in this setup, you've got um, what, what you might call a smart display. So this the, the PIDs here are directly connected to the Internet. They are able to speak MQTT themselves. They are able to understand the messages directly that are coming from the broker. So there doesn't need to be anything in between. There's no gateway there as such. There's no um there's no additional layer of translation of the messages they are consuming and publishing directly to the, to the central mqtt broker um the vendor specific services that, that you can see on there um with the sort of tool toolbox icon um is deliberately hanging off of the network and 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 below it so it's not intercepting messages and translating them it's just another service that's um listening in if you like eavesdropping on the uh, on the network um, and is also able to to publish to it as well so that might be some kind of um, vendor specific analysis it might be just sitting there listening to what's going on um, and analyzing um i know the latency of when there's an incoming message followed by an outgoing message um, and it ties the two together and just thinks hold on this there's something wrong here these things are taking 10 seconds um so, so it, it, you know, it's just maybe monitoring performance of the network, something like that it may exist. It may not exist, would be entirely optional. It wouldn't be required to have those Internet connected PIDs. Um, I mean, the, the key use case that I see for that is um, where you might have um, more detailed diagnostics about something that's going going on with the display. So, you know, if the core service says, um, you know, tell me if you're not working um, or tell me if you're overheating. 
actually there might be another layer of of diagnostics that says actually the second led on the third line um is not working you know that that's perhaps not something that the central cms and and maintenance needs to know about but the people maintaining the display needs to know about um and so you know you might have that as a, you know hanging off there Okie dokie. Let's just um, pop down to the third one. Um, so yeah, th I guess this has more in common with the um, with the first one, really. Um, but because there's no um, low power requirement or legacy requirement, there's no need for translation, if you like, of of an MQTT message into some other low level protocol or proprietary protocol. Um, it's purely being used as a, a network bridge um, in this in this diagram. So the um, the signs are on their own private network, um, and it's just again this, this MQTT bridge here um, would be, I would imagine, um, a piece of open source software off the shelf, which you know th these things are available and they include functionality to bridge between networks. They need a bit of configuration, and that would obviously be part of the um the project to, to to configure them so that they could actually communicate between the two networks um but all it's doing there is it's um bridging the public internet with whatever private network the signs are hanging off of and it's just ensuring that the messages uh, in both directions um get delivered um in a timely manner that, and that's that's it there's no more to it than that in supplier c's case um right i've got a several Several hands up, um, Mike. Um, the diagram obviously copes with multiple different PID suppliers. Is there any um, consideration that there might be other suppliers on the left hand side? So other information suppliers, um, i.e. other CMS systems in inverted commas, um, attached to this on the, on the left hand side of the diagram? There's certainly nothing to stop that. Um, I'm not sure whether that is a particular requirement for um, Transport for Wales to be able to have multiple CMSs, um, but certainly the way that this is designed, system, it yeah. would be supported. Um, you know, it would just be another um, yeah. subscriber to the data or a publisher of the data plugged into the network, um, and that it, it is flexible in that respect. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's, it's certainly it's nothing quite, stopping that. Just a question about the diagram. It didn't seem to allow for that, but. Yes, I think that's, yeah, perhaps we can improve on that. It, it's perhaps um, being too specific about the particular um, start point here, which was the um, Transport for Wales sort of concept for, for a particular project. And, and maybe it needs to be more general. Um, and certainly in general terms, there could be any number of other devices here. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. OK, um, who have we got? Uh, Mustafa, I think you were next. Yeah. Uh, so, point on that, and then a question for suppliers on the call. Um, whilst having multiple publishers to displays, uh, you know, that may be a sensible approach. I think there needs to be some mechanism uh, for displays to be linked to a single, you know, or, or, or uh, assigned to some CMSs, whether it's one or more, because what you don't want is uh, multiple CMSs just because they're on the same network <laughs> uh, publishing stuff that um, goes onto displays mistakenly uh, just because it can get to the MQP, uh, MQTT server. Uh, so mm -hmm. whilst I get you, 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 you might want the possibility of ha having multiple CMSs, you need some mechanism to control which CMSs, whether that's one or more, can talk to individual uh, displays, whether it's via other systems or not, is it irrelevant? And then secondly, um, I, I, I welcome feedback from suppliers on whether they have implemented MQTT already before for other uh, projects um, and, and what their views are on it. You know, it sounds really good. I, I've never used it because all the services I've procured or, or been involved in delivering have been, you know, rich, lots of data back and forth, real time uh constant 
whereas here we are talking in some cases data going uh, irregularly over patchy networks so um, it, it, the concept itself sounds really good uh, but I, I welcome views from vendors who've implemented or if, if they haven't implemented how much they know about it already. Thank you. Um, I could see Patrick's hand was already up. Um, I don't know if that's an answer to, to the question that's just been asked or a, or something else, but um, let's start with you. <laughs> oh, you're on mute again, Patrick. That really is too, three. can we make it seven strikes now? Um, <laughs> so just coming out some stuff, I, unfortunately I can't tell you, um, uh, there might be other people in the company, but I can't tell you about MQTT, so um, I haven't really got any experience of that. Could you just sort of scroll up a little bit to the, so I can see PID Publisher A again? Because obviously you've got the, the, the interface, so a couple of questions around that. You've got interface to proprietary communications protocol. Now, really what you're talking about is, is that, if that's an interface, that's kind of holding CMS content because you're passing CMS content through a gateway. Um, and that is a communications protocol, but in a way you're, what you're really doing is you're, you're kind of syncing the content management system in blue with sort of a local content management system which is sort of holding it with that cog shape so in a way which i think is very useful for the project is you you're via mqtt and i, I can't comment whether that's the right way you're kind of developing a cms to cms sync there if you like which i think is quite important because when you've got the word legacy which which it might be quite nice to change i appreciate that might mm -hmm. be might undermine the entire project, but there will be a transition period where suppliers will need to make displays compatible. And of course, legacy displays will never be compatible, which is why you've got to have this in there. But I, I think it's about meeting TFW's aspiration, and that's where you get into this difference between requirements and specification. You, you certainly got to specify some of the CMS content exchange so that there's a standard that everybody works to, and I absolutely get that. Um, but for example, you know, there is a requirement to deliver content from the TFW CMS to the displays. Um, and you've not on, on, on the, the legacy PID, you've not. Um, uh, you, there's, there's a requirement to do that, but you've not specified how that will be done. You know that that's passed across to the vendor and then, then the stuff on the right hand side of the cog is, is down to us to do, which is which is great. But at the moment, that choice is linked to it being a legacy PID. Um, the diagrams below are saying, actually, if you're providing a PID and it's connected by the interface, uh, by the internet, kind of you're maybe not allowed to use an, an interface and a proprietary form of communication. Whereas I think you should be allowed to, because at the end of the day, the requirement is to be able to use the CMS to communicate with the screens. So that was really just a note about being quite careful with procurement, because a lot of procurement does give specifications where they don't need to. The image must be able to scroll on the screen. OK, well, let's completely wipe out any chance of a flip dot display then, which is a low power system because it can't scroll. What you actually need to do is to be able to display calling patterns. OK, they don't have to scroll and, and that can stifle innovation. So OK, lot, lot, lots of points there, but I think, yeah, that not necessarily forcing suppliers to have to go straight by MQTT to the displays, but still adhering to all of the protocols that you're defining here to have genuine open systems would, would, mm -hmm. would I suggest you comment on that, if that makes sense. Absolutely, yes. I think uh, I think Tim's just captured that exactly there. So yes, where, where it says legacy on there, then that could be legacy or it could be a future low power display or it could be um, yeah, just any other future display that has particular requirements that mean it can't be connected directly to the internet, um, for example. Yeah. So uh, and, yes, absolutely. And yeah. you might find that over, over time, you know, obviously as vendors move towards this model, it's a, it's a more cost effective way for them to provide solutions rather than providing gateways. But that, that will be a natural evolutionary process that won't undermine what you're doing here. But it gives people time to do that and to put that gateway in between and be able to offer kind of straight away any display systems they've got available to TFW and any procurement without having to fit around this model immediately. They just have to do the server to server rather than replace all the display interfaces. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Kemi. Yeah, and I just wanted to confirm that I like the idea of this, these simply being options for how you connect 
as opposed to being associated with a particular type of display. So I think the change that Tim has made works for us as well. Yeah. Thank you. Um, going back to uh, Mustafa's question about MQTT, um, I know the that Steve. I know that in some of the implementations you've got, you've um, used MQTT, haven't you? I believe we have. Yes, uh, and I think hasn't there been a conversation with Peter? Um, I think Rob, didn't you have a chat with Peter? So I think I'd probably let Peter <laughs> answer that more than more than myself, Tim. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yes, I did have a, a chat with Peter, um, and yeah, I mean he, you know, he said that it, it had been used, perhaps not quite in this way um, that we're yeah. proposing here um, in terms of um, content management to to displays, um, but it had been used, I think, in in um, communication to moving vehicles, um, which yeah. would suggest that if it works. Um, when communicating with moving vehicles, which could have patchy reception, then actually we shouldn't have any problems with something that's a little bit more static that we're talking about here. Um, so certainly that was a very positive conversation in terms of it being a, a suitable technology. Um, and I've, I've had similar feedback from one other supplier who has had limited um, or has performed limited experiments, let's say, <laughs> with MQTT. And again, the feedback was was very positive. Yes, it looks like a very sensible way to do it. Um, yeah. Right. Yes, I'm not sure if any of the other suppliers on the call here have uh, dabbled with MQTT or not. I would certainly be interested to hear either now or in a one to one call later of, of any feedback that you can provide on on that. Yeah, uh, I know Trapeze have got experience of using MQTT. Um, I don't know whether you're aware of the detail of that, Mike. Uh, no, unfortunately, I, I'm not. I'd have to go back and uh, and ask colleagues about that, but I can do. I'll uh, I'll I'll see what we've got. Um, yeah. but it, at the moment, the MQTT is black box to me, but I'm I'm, ass I'm assuming it's functional and, and fit for purpose. So that's fine. But I'll, I'll I'll come back if I've got any information. Yeah, I, it it is pretty new to public transport in the UK. It does have to be said, um, but um its use is quite widespread in Europe now. So, for example, um, a lot of Scandinavian procurements um, expect it for um, vehicle communications. So, um, you know, you, you're rather than having a direct connection from a vehicle to a to a back office, all of that data communications is being done um, via MQTT with requirements for location data updates, typically every couple of seconds. Um, so, you know, with, with thousands of vehicles, so it's very scalable. Um, it's just and, and it's being used um, in a number of the standards bodies in Europe. So in Germany, they're making quite a lot of use of it. Um, and um, one of the German cities is about to base their whole new real-time procurement using MQTT for all communications. Um, a bit brave if you ask me, um, <laughs> but um, um, so they're making use of it and IT for PT, um, which um, Transport for London um, is heavily involved in. Um, a lot of their communications are moving to MQTT. So there's there's a, there's a reasonable amount of implementation experience in Europe, but um, not very much in public transport um, in the UK. So that is a risk. Um, it does have to be said, um, but um, but. Um, it's the way everybody else is going, so it feels like the sort of what Rob has suggested see, feels like the, the right sort of direction for a new standard. Mustafa, you had your? No, that's no. not me. That might be someone else. Oh, OK. Kemi, your hands up. Is that a legacy? Legacy, taking it down now, sorry. OK, yeah. 
Yeah. You sure it wasn't a low powered one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so it, it, while it might be worth me um, pulling together a few links of um, some um, examples of where it's been used um, so that you can see um, and potentially talk to some of those people involved. Um, I think and I'll just, circulate that round um, next week. Sorry, Tim, trying to cut you off there. Um, I think, yes, to, just to add to what Tim has been saying, it is quite new to public transport, perhaps, but um, MQTT as a concept has been around for many years um, and is extensively used in the, the what you'd call the Internet of Things. Um, so it's a very popular um, protocol there and hence that the all this um number of open source implementations i mean it's 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 not just one implementation that you can download off the some dodgy site on the internet i mean there are numerous implementations there are libraries for just about every programming language you can imagine um, and for running on any operating system you can imagine so it is it's very widely used um it's just that it's a little bit new to public transport i think is the uh, is the thing I've got a quick question. Um, so my hand went back up. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not a legacy one. Um, I think f uh, w because we're primarily constrained on the the basic uh, requirements around, you know, uh, schedule, um, real time messages, uh, merge messages, and QTT absolutely sounds completely right. But I just wanted to check again, you know, Tim, you mentioned a couple of implementations on uh, moving buses, etc. How does it deal with graphical content? Now, if there's a, a video, for example, and it's five megabytes uh, in size, does that still work? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the, that's one of the beauties of it um, is that fundamentally it's designed for um, unreliable networks so um if you've you know b because what what happens for example is that content management system goes here's a message for a display it puts it on the broker and it sits there on the broker until the display connects to the broker and um then consumes it um and then it can be cleared down from from the broker um obviously you know if if it's a real time message the display then needs to go actually that's out of date i'm not going to use it but um if you've got a large um piece of content um and you lose connection part way through downloading it and things like that then there are recovery mechanisms for recovering from partial download a bit like um ftp is a bit old hat these days and, and and out of favor but you know the the recovery mechanisms in 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 ftp where you know you don't restart the whole download you start from where you um lost connection and so that's part of the fundamental um of mqtt which is why it's quite so clever actually um uh, so related to that and uh you know, obviously, I've only just seen the spec, so I had a quick whiz through, yeah. and there was one specific element re related to graphical content, which seems to suggest rather than passing the video down, it would pass down a URL to the video. Um, so, in that instance, it would then be down to the displays to go and get the uh, video from the appropriate link. Um, okay, rather than the MQTT server sitting uh, a copy of all the stuff that it needs to send and is sending it down. So is that the right way? So you, you send a message to say this is where to get it from and the display then goes and gets it. You can actually do it both ways. Um, in, in in my mind, when I was drafting the specification, it was very much, if if it's a large binary content, it seems to make sense that you would just sort of uh, send a url to that large binary content and let the device pull that down um, now i'm sort of coming from the angle there that if it's a 
if it's a smart enough device that it can process large binary content, so I'm thinking video particularly there, then probably it's got internet connectivity of its own. This probably isn't going to be a low power device because what are they going to do with large amounts of binary content? Um, that might be a wrong assumption. I'm willing to be challenged on that. Um, and, and yes, what Tim said is also correct. You can put any kind of payload you like into an MQTT message. So you could put um, binary data in there directly um, and, and probably for something maybe as big as an image or something, that would be fine. Um, I don't think it would be a sensible idea to start putting very large video files into MQTT messages and potentially clogging up the, the broker or the network because then you have to start thinking about um, bigger servers for the MQTT broker and you potentially cause yourself problems. So hence in the um, in the so spec document, I've got this to concept of, of a message that points you to a URL and you go off and fetch the content yourself. Yeah. So related to that, so we, um, you know, the location of the larger binary needs to be some sort of web server. So we'd probably need, you know, our, if the content management system is dealing with all of that, we need to make sure there's a web server uh, on the content management service okay. uh, or system for the display to download that type of content. So rather than it being uh, publish, you're publishing the location, but then you're making available the, the files for download as required. Yeah. And, I think you and might, that, might be including that in, uh, not including, but certainly you know, that, that that's a consideration we need to include in our spec then, or your spec. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's yeah. A, 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 yes. I think in the documentation we need to work through the the different options um, because, um, for example. Um, you might be able to point somebody uh, a display at a YouTube video um, in Supply B example, um, but actually if you were in Supply C example where you've got a bridge and those displays haven't got direct access to the internet, um, you might want to do, you know, they wouldn't be able to access that um, YouTube video and so you would either need to then have something um, on that private network that's serving that, um, or um, you need to, to to be sending it as a message. So um, I think, Rob, we need to work through the yep. options for those large files and make sure that people know how to support it. And it's a potentially a project level decision as to which one you go for. It might be that we actually want to firm that up though um as part of the standard you know this is the recommended way of doing it but if you really wanted to you could do it another way mm -hmm. yeah i mean it it, it it sort of didn't get fully considered on the grounds that the specification was primarily thinking about the text-based displays in its first draft um but yes certainly as we move towards the the second category the the sort of smarter displays that could process video and and, and this sort of other content absolutely we need to uh, we need to consider that i have to admit in my mind i had assumed that these things would be um hosted elsewhere on the internet your youtube example is is great there um or it would be going off to um i don't know a news service or a weather service or something somewhere i i hadn't really considered the possibility that this the 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 binary content would actually be curated within the cms itself um but that that is obviously something that that is a possibility um, there's no reason why it couldn't um you know i, I think that there, later. yeah i think there, there probably you know there, there will be images um adverts and those mm -hmm. things where you're going to curate through the cms but absolutely you know weather news um local whatever that those would probably be a rss feed elsewhere mm -hmm. Yeah, the traffic information, that sort of thing, I suppose, could be useful. Um, Patrick, you've got your hand up there. And I remembered to unmute. Um, yes, I, I, I agree with all you say that. I, I think that's right. I put my hand up kind of when, when you're having discussion about all the video content kind of being um, sort of sourced directly and the potential for streaming it. 
I think a key thing here, not just video content necessarily, is, is just that those thoughts and keeping those options open for what's essentially held locally offline, potentially. Um, and, and I think video content is, is key if, if, if there's some sort of interactive display where somebody can choose one from a, a thousand YouTube videos, then clearly you're going to, to want to stream that. You can't possibly hold it locally and upload everything. Um, but if you've got a, you know, the equivalent of a showreel, something that a lot of CMSs support and TFW are wanting to put up a, a repeated um, image about, um, you know, COVID safety, you don't want that streamed every single time because your bandwidth is going to go through the roof. So there's certainly got that ability to cache things. And, and I think in terms of sort of binaries and, and holding things locally, um, I, I, again, maybe this is in here, apologies if it, if it is already, but certainly the idea of uh, obviously you're, you're feeding through real time information. Um, which is great in terms of what's on your displays, but um, as you say, a lot of a lot of occasions, comms isn't perfect. So what happens if comms goes down? Now, obviously, if you're if you're pointing at a website and comms goes down, I mean, you can you can trap it, but you get the equivalent of page 404, you know, unavailable, and there's no useful content because nothing's held locally on your device. But obviously, if you've got a more powerful device, then you know you download the timetable to the device. So that if you can't show real time because there's no real time connectivity, you can at least show timetables as to what should be happening and, and maybe annotated appropriately. So, so certainly that idea of pushing you know, reasonably large binaries via via this, you know, be they video, be they timetables, I think is 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 certainly something that's worth touching on, which I think you're going to as you as you you know develop things further on. But but certainly that timetable aspect, even not even not the video one, is 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 certainly something you might want to do with your text based displays as well. Um, I think just to add to that, you know, for, for TFW in particular, there is an absolute requirement. You know, if all else goes wrong, there is at least the time to, scheduled timetable available on all devices, no matter what. So that takes priority over everything else. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Right. Unless anyone's got anything else on this architectural diagram, we possibly should um, move on. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I can't see any other hands up. Um, although I'm, I have to say I'm glad that we've spent a long time on the architecture because that was crucial um, to what we've been doing so far. And actually, that's a large part of the uh, the draft document that's been written has been focusing on that. Um, so, uh, yes, that was very, very worthwhile. Um, so discovery. I, th I think I touched on this a little bit earlier, and, and, and that's that's really it. It's this concept of being able to I use the word dynamically there, but it, it's yeah, it's it's really about minimal on site configuration during the commissioning of a new device. It, it's about being able to plug it in essentially um, at, at its um, location, whether that's a bus stop or a station platform or whatever it is, uh, making sure it's connected to the network and then that's it. it it sorts itself out um from that point onwards um and so i know that some um sign vendors are already doing this and they have their own internal ways of doing it um i know that others are aspiring to do it um and it seems sensible therefore to build this concept into um, the messaging that we've got and make sure that we've got messaging types um for a new device on a network to announce its presence and announce its ID so that a CMS that perhaps has already been given some configuration information about this uh, this device with this particular ID can then send it a bunch of configuration data and it can set itself up um, and and start working directly. Um, it seems like a, an obvious thing to do and a very sensible thing to do. Um, so I, I suspect that nobody's going to complain about that, but um, obviously I would welcome any comments on. Uh, uh, no, it's much more complex and nuanced than that. Um, it will never work, um, but um, I'm hoping that there won't be any such comments. It's nicely quiet. That's good. Yeah, marvellous. OK. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we like. Um, again, I think we've touched on uh, some of this uh, business already. I mean, it's at a very basic level. Um, every single device on the network should be sending a message 
let's say once a minute, once every five minutes, whatever it might happen to be, and that's to be decided, and that's perhaps worth having a little discussion um, about, um, just to say, hello, this is me, I'm alive, um, and no more than that. Um, and then any other services that are interested in keeping tabs on who's alive, now obviously the CMS will be interested in knowing which signs are still there, um, but there could be additional services. They could be vendor specific services for fault management, or they could be statistical services that are just gathering um, data on performance or, or anything else. Um, and they could sit there monitoring um, these heartbeats just to, to have a clear idea of what's going on. Um, I guess you could also use it to monitor um, the, the overall state of the network. I mean, if you aggregate heartbeat data, then you can determine if an, an entire private network has gone offline because its gateways failed. You would be able to detect that remotely. Um, you know, it's it's easy to say, well, you know, it's the gateways clearly failed, but then, you know, for the rest of the network to be able to know that that's failed and do something about it, that's that's quite a powerful tool. Um, and obviously, because of the way the pub sub system works, um, everybody publishes a heartbeat, anyone who's interested can listen to it um, and use that as they wish to to, to monitor um, their counterpart devices elsewhere on the network. Um, one key message just to put in here whilst we're talking about heartbeats is that in my mind at least, I mean I know these days bandwidth isn't such a consideration as perhaps it used to be, but a heartbeat message really should be tiny. It should be the absolute bare minimum. This is my ID and perhaps this is the timestamp that I was sending the message. That's it. Um, again, people may have other thoughts on that. Um, I've separated heartbeat from status messaging. I think that's a slightly different thing. Typically, status might be a request response pattern where one device wants to ask another device, what is your status? And it can get a, a a more detailed report of the status back, whereas the heartbeat shouldn't contain extended status information. It is purely the minimal message to say I'm alive and that's it. Um, so yes, um, any comments on any of that? Oh, oh um, now this is interesting. I keep seeing hands popping up in on one part of the screen by one person's picture, but on the list of names, it comes up against someone else's name. So I've got one against Mike's name at the moment. Yeah, uh, so yeah, let's start with Mike. Yeah, a uh, couple of things, probably minor. Um, Frequency of heartbeat, <clears throat> I think I would, if I was designing this, I would recommend a minimum and I would let the response to the discovery um, potentially affect that so that mm -hmm. the CMS can respond to discovery with config over the heartbeat frequency. Yep. Yeah, um, but yeah, you want a minimum. And the other thing is, um, as well as status being requested, status can it might be worth having status being spontaneous. Um, for example, impact alarms, um, you probably want to know about them instantly. Um, so there's a, there's a probably need for the PID to be able to uh, asynchronously just create a spontaneous status alert. Um, that's that's it really, that's my two points. Thank you. I'm just gonna um, respond to that before I invite Patrick to comment. Um, the way that I've structured it, I've assumed that that will be a separate um, event type. Um, so status really is about the request response pattern and, and, it, and, a, and an event, an asynchronous event would be an entirely different um, messaging type, which obviously okay. could be triggered um, in response to anything. I mean, that could be okay. a, a change in temperature. It could be a, a shock alarm. It could, it, you know, that those sorts of um, event messages. Okay, so you've got an alert type of you. That is so, so there's, yes, there's a separate, I, I can't remember, I think it's just called sensor event. So maybe the terminology needs tightening up. Maybe alert would be better than the event. Or in fact, maybe there are, those are two separate categories. So um, that's, that's definitely something to look at. We'll perhaps come to that um, a little bit later, but thank you for, for highlighting that. Um, Patrick. Uh, exactly that. 
so perfect yeah come, come to it later it's uh, that idea of good heavens mains power's just gone i've got five seconds to send a message to tell everyone goodbye rather than something centrally just says it's not working it's not working it's not working you know mm-hmm. you just send a field engineer out there necessarily you just have to wait for the grid to get power back again so yeah exactly that point that mike's made so if, that, if that's elsewhere that's perfect yeah perfect okay i mean, I'd need to dig into this a little bit more i believe there's a concept actually at the mqtt level as well which is i can't remember what the the name of it is off the top of my head but it's something like the uh, last will and testament type concept so you can sort of there, there's this ability to send a, a sort of i'm dying message um into mqtt which then influences other devices on the network they can be aware of of what's going on when there's not time to do sort of other types of communication and um, whether that's completely relevant to us is something that i need to go and investigate and if it is obviously i'll i'll build it into the um specification um i've still got mike's hand visible i don't know if that's an old one or a new one oh that's a mistake i'll take it down sorry okie dokie good okay so i think we can move on um i think perhaps we've covered this a little bit already i don't want to yeah. do its death particularly um but yes it's it's about the flexibility um, i'm i i think i'm interested if anyone's got any suggestions of other services that could be useful to sit on the network but um certainly in my mind it's it's this business of something that's gathering statistics to measure kpis or something maybe there's a specific discovery server for a particular vendor that sits on the network and provides additional configuration to signs that belong to that particular manufacturer I, who knows i mean the, the point is that the system will be flexible and will support that and any device that is mqtt capable um would be able to to message other devices on the network as and when required or just just listen um equally just just be a subscriber to, to to listen in and aggregate data and build reports or whatever it might be oh i've got some some hands appearing um michael yeah it's probably a bit radical this but um one of the problem things that we've lost uh, since the early days of real time and tim will know about this is the ability to clear down a sign um in real in good time for a bus leaving a stop mm-hmm. and it's thing that's really been lost largely uh certainly in my understanding anyway uh, does any of this fit in with a, an ability to somehow flag up uh, for a sign to talk back to a system to say i mean if it can say i'm going to vote to die can it say things like this service has just left or is this out of scope do you think for this it could absolutely do that. I mean, obviously, you'd need some means of sensing that at the location. Um, if if there was a way that a location could tell if a if the vehicle had arrived or departed, um, yeah. certainly the uh, the messaging would be supported for it to communicate that. Um, in terms of what's gone into the current document for clear down, it's very much been considered to be. A message that's sent from the CMS to say yeah, you need to yeah. clear this down. If you've still got this um, departure listed, you need to get it off that screen now. Um, and then there's a mechanism in there for the um, the display to actually respond to that. Say to to say yes, I've done that now. I have cleared that down. Right. Um, and, and the purpose of that sort of request response pattern there is exactly for another for a different service that we're sort of considering here to be able to analyze. How, you know how how was how long did it take for the sign to receive that message and respond to it and yeah, um, you know okay. a- after issuing the clear down how many seconds elapsed before the sign confirmed that it was done um okay. so so that concept is there um doesn't really tell us how to do anything about it if it takes no, no, you know, 30 that's, seconds that's to, to do it's it. in there but, um, but 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 the concept of uh, uh, of doing it is certainly in there and and being able to measure it um to gather statistics on 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 the clear down performance okay thanks very much okay uh mike um your hand is also up i don't believe my hand is up but... oh it's gone away now okay 
yeah maybe that's a maybe that's a latency issue at my end with the messaging in uh, microsoft teams yeah right so shall we just have a look at these message topics now i think really now that we've got to these we've probably considered most of these in passing um over the last 20 minutes or so um let's uh well let's start on the left that's conventional isn't it so um published by the cms um hopefully all the obvious stuff um and nothing missing but obviously now is the time to to shout if you think there's been a, a serious omission here in in what we've listed um so right at the top there scheduled departure um, and I think that's been said a couple of times already. That's the absolute most basic, most important information because that's the thing we fall back to if all else fails. So scheduled departure information, real time departure information, clear down. We've literally just been uh, discussing that. Um, and then in addition to those departure messages, then we've got information messages and emergency messages. Now, an information message in my mind, if you're considering one of those three line LED displays, an information message is one that scrolls along the bottom line of the display, um, but leaves space for a couple of departure messages uh, uh, above it. Um, whereas an emergency message would be a full screen message, obliterates everything else that's on the screen and just sort of takes over. Um, and that's really the distinction um that the specification makes um and then finally um discovery response um obviously the that's initiated by um by a, a display and then the cms would respond with some kind of configuration information um i can see uh yes or oh, i can see mike's hand again i don't know if it's a real one or whether it's a phantom one again it's a real one this time uh, a couple of things um information information message uh I'm, I'm thinking about the, the current Siri SM um, stop line notice implementation. Um, are you are you just covering a, a single generic information message or are you covering service based messages as well? Yeah, the idea is that it could relate to um, an entire operator um, or an entire line of a service um, or an individual um location to be targeted um, or indeed an, an individual sign um you know using its unique id okay um so all of those okay, will great. be covered um that's, that's good the second point was have you considered having a snapshot request published by the cms responded to by the pid indicating what the PID believes is currently is currently showing. Ah, OK, um, I think. That was discussed at a previous meeting, I think we did talk about that, and I I have sort of lumped that in with um, system status, I think. Um, OK, but it needs yeah, I, it'll need a specific. It needs fleshing out a little bit. Type. Yeah, OK. I mean, that because for a text display, what do you send back if you've got three messages being displayed and things like that? And if it's a TFT with images and things like that on it, yeah. what's needed back? That might actually be a JPEG, JPEG screenshot. Yeah, I was thinking in the context of the, of the three line LED is just a, a simple um, structure that, that provided the the number of uh, the, the prediction lines it's showing and any messaging it's showing in a textual format. Um, yeah. just, just as clarification, because sometimes, uh, I know it doesn't sound great, but sometimes you need to check what the sign is actually showing based upon the messages you sent it. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's very, very sensible. Um, yeah, that's something to add. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, thanks. Uh, Patrick. Yeah, I, I guess there's certainly that idea of being able to see what a screen is showing, and you can do that at different levels, as you, as you say. Um, yeah. It's reasonably easy to kind of capture a, a JPEG because you're, you're kind of pulling that back in from video memory. So unless someone's put a, you know, a, a sheet over the screen or, or the, the, the you know, screen is not working, but you're still writing memory into video, 
uh, memory or whatever, then you you know you get something sensible. Um, with, with LED signs, you know, very often the kind of the CMS recreates out of the data what the sign should be showing. But I guess that's that's you know where 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 sort of vendors. I mean, we on some of our lower power stuff, we actually pull up the, the memory that's being used to control what the what the kind of the the dots are, are showing and sort of then recreate it out of that. So you're you're kind of pulling stuff out of the sign and chucking it back. So. But, but certainly something in terms of querying what's on there at whatever level that is, I think is is really good. And I guess also it, it sort of it says scheduled departure, real time departure. We Obviously, there are lots and lots of scheduled departures in a timetable, but I just thought it was worth making that clear, especially what, what Mustafa was saying about, you know, the minimum requirement is to show the scheduled departure. But obviously, if your comms is down, your, your CMS can't publish in real time the scheduled departure. So so just making it very clear that the, the, the CMS are publishing timetables, um, you know, rather than the individual elements that, that would essentially be presented on the screen as a result of having a timetable is maybe worth just, just stating. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, very much so. I mean, I, I can't remember if it went into the uh, draft of the document that's been circulated, but I think the um, both of those scheduled departure and real time departure messaging payloads, I had assumed would be based on their Siri counterparts. Um, that may or may not be a sensible approach, um, and I'm open to suggestions there. Um, may, maybe rather than a series of scheduled departure messages being fired off at the beginning of the day or whatever, maybe there there needs to be some concept of a full timetable in one go. Uh -huh. um, I, that and I'm not sure I, that that probably is supported in Siri somewhere. As yeah, well. ST. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, the little used, <laughs> by the way, but it will be good to get some ST yep. flowing around. <laughs> So, I can yeah, use that then as a use case with send. It's important if you've got limited communications availability to, to, to maybe distribute a timetable every couple of days. Um, that that would be very useful. Yes. Yes. So especially, you know, if if, if you know, a classic example is, you know, a bus is not showing up, so um, you know, someone's just not entered it correctly into the into the Trans exchange or however it got in there. So you you know it's kind of can you can you reload the timetable overnight, please? So it's right tomorrow, sort of thing. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's such a good reason mm -hmm. for syncing it reasonably recently, reasonably often. Yeah. Actually, that's that's um, raised a question with me. I hadn't considered the concept that a timetable would live on a display sign in that sense. I think in my mind, I'd assumed that you would send a timetable for the day ahead once every 24 hours or something like that, that you wouldn't perhaps have a week's worth or an indefinite period's worth of timetable stored on the sign. Is that a wrong assumption? Should we have a, a fallback, fallback timetable? Um, I, I, I don't know. Am I overthinking that? If, if you oh. go back as far as some of the um, private mobile radio networks. Mm -hmm. um, you used to have engineers that used to drive around the displays, plug a laptop in and, and load up um, the the foreseeable futures timetables mm -hmm. and it would understand day of the week and bank holidays and all sorts of stuff. Um, I don't think anybody does that anymore. I think it's, it'll all be done <laughs> over the air. Um, but there are certainly people out there that have got a week look ahead on their displays. It's back. To, it's probably back to your. So you're not putting the hand up. It's very back to your requirements. Your TFW will <clears throat> will probably want to specify. You know, if there is no communications link, you know, how long can you can you display mm. something useful in terms of departures on the display? Um, you know, until it has to say no information available. You know, please call this number. You know, the, the, if, if someone puts a a JCB through a, a key mm. fiber optic cable in, in 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 central Cardiff. You know, you, you you could be two or three days waiting for you know for data to go back again. So I you know 20, 40, 48 hours is usually is probably sort of fine because you get the next day and into the day after that. But uh, it, it, again, it might be a a variable that that others are better placed to comment on than me. But it but it might come back from the client ultimately as to you know how long they want an offline sign to still be showing something useful. Yeah, clearly, if it's six months, there'll be lots and lots and lots of timetable changes, and probably what's on there is rubbish. Uh, but if it's two days, yeah. that's probably absolutely fine. 
Thank you. Yeah, that's that's good. I like I like the forty eight hour sort of window. That sounds reasonable. Um, I, I certainly again in in my mind, I hadn't assumed that there would be any concept of days of the week or whether it's a public holiday at, at a sign level. It's purely this is your list of departures for the next twenty four hours or the next forty eight hours, whatever it might be. Um, and that's curated by the CMS. So the sign isn't interested in trans exchange or anything else. It just wants a list of departure times. Um, that's how I'd been approaching it. Um, so if, if that is not right, then do stop me there. Um, Richard. Yeah, I mean, is that just bringing in the low power stuff there? Um, is that maybe an issue with with low power, you know, thinking about that and the, the, the uses that are going out? I mean, certainly it's something that we're interested in um, when we're looking at our network. We have obviously everything, uh, well, largely paper based. Um, and we do have timetables uh, that, that live out in rural areas for many, many a moon, not, you know, probably because the uh, you know, service delivery doesn't get out to do anything about it. So I mean, I think that's a practical issue just to just to put that in context to print there. And obviously, you know, the backups are are definitely something on a rural level, you know, where perhaps I'm just saying in Northern Ireland at a rural level, we don't have real time um, and schedule information that is actually updatable, uh, certainly through COVID, um, is, is actually a great thing, you know, to have that, you know, even if, if you can imagine, even if comms go down, which my goodness, in the days that we live in um, can happen. Um, and we have a lot of reliance on comms. Um, you know, it definitely is, you know, to have something that is robust. I do like the, the talk about, you know, having a longer look ahead, um, you know, having that, uh, we have relied on that a lot with screens, even in stations, whenever we've had major events. Um, talking about security, it's one thing that happened. Uh, you probably, you might have known that um, our Translink got hit by a, a major security issue just before the pandemic. Uh, it brought down every single system that we could, that it could find um, and uh, basically held us to ransom. And that was a major issue. Now, if we were compromised, um, you know, if, if there's some way of of having that, I think it really, you know, we could have lost a, our whole network out there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, uh, I'm just bringing this up because it's quite fresh in our minds. Mm. Um, our IT have actually kicked kicked us off the corporate network in in um, uh, in in stations. Where we have 21st century screens there. Um, but you know, network security is obviously if people are going mobile, will become a bigger issue, I'm sure, in the future. Just a yeah. point from from print up, if you know what I mean. Yeah, uh, there are cases of displays being hacked and messages being put on them. Um, but uh, I mean, it's a that's an interesting use case, actually, Richard, where you've got an e-ink timetable sheet, for example, um, that displays the current timetable for the day, you know, at the moment. The, the suppliers of those have to understand trans exchange and import that. Um, and process it. Actually, they would probably be quite grateful to be given it in a more easily consumable approach. And so whilst it might not be a key Wales requirement, I can see from a wider, if this become, you know, if we're looking at this to make this as wider use case set of standard as possible, um, you know, being able to supply months ahead and for a display to know whether it's a bank holiday or not actually is is you know probably quite a useful thing to have yeah mm. i just know we've had the issues even you know we're just doing a trial of solar at the moment we're very a bit behind the curve on that one uh sorry on no power and uh we have you know frequently lost connection uh we had some with a lot of growth over the summer um which was because of the amazing summer that we had um and it just knocked out it just knocked it out completely and that was us you know what i mean and that actually you know i mean practically speaking we had to go and speak to you know we couldn't even get the tree cut because it wasn't even on our property and the department couldn't touch it because it was private and it just moved out you know changed hands now that's that's just something that happened that that unit was out for maybe a couple of weeks you know three three weeks 
Mm. So yeah. 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 Um Patrick, your hand is up there. Yeah, I, I guess just a, a, a kind of a comment on that as well, which which um, also bring, I know we've, we've got 11 minutes left, but I was just going to come out with the word audio, but I'll come back to that in a second. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, with, with, with something like the e-ink, you know, if you do have a very low power processor at the receiving end, effectively, you, you don't necessarily need to, well, it, it, again, it, it depends on memory and how much memory you've got, but, but obviously you can, you know, you can download images of timetables, which essentially could cover, you know, um, easily the next month or the next week if it's a rural service, you know, by doing all the, all the heavy lifting and the processing at the CMS end and, and sort of sending an image through, um, you know, rather than to necessarily sort of handle timetables and generate things, things locally. Mm. Um, but that, but that comes back to the idea of, of, you know, are you giving signs you know, um, things to display, kind of, you know, messages versus data. Um, and, and obviously, if you put an image on an e-ink display, it, it, it's just a series of bits. It doesn't understand anything about that. Um, if you pass data to any display, then obviously it can it can do stuff with it. And and I, I did note that audio was mentioned under the sort of provide a link to audio in the same way that the sort of the video was. But certainly in terms of um, inclusivity, um, you certainly all of our signs, you know, whether they're um, low power or not, have always supported audio, um, actually, and in terms of the Disabilities Act, uh, they have to, or they certainly should do. Um, and um, yeah, just from a societal point of view, they really ought to. So I, I, I didn't know, sort of see anything in here at the moment, and again, I guess it might come as a as a later thought, but careful about leaving it too late because it kind of should be should be a core aspect. I think is the ability to 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 make announcements, and that's all about sending data through to science rather than images, so they can understand it, um, which is more relevant to the low power ones rather than the other ones. But also, then as soon as you get into audio, you get into um, you know audio manipulation, which is a, certainly a key part of our. CMS, um, you know, uh, we could say uh, in our Norfolk systems that departures are leaving costacy, but everybody would roll around laughing because it's pronounced cossy. So, you know, there are, there are other things in the CMS and quite a bit kind of audio related. Now, that might be beyond scope, you know, that might be something else which is fed in from a sort of a, a localised supplier basis. But it's just how far you're going to go down on the audio was a was a key question for us as well and I, and I don't know whether Keith's still on call but obviously there's, there's React and all sorts of other audio standards to trigger things as well but certainly t telling people and looking after the visually impaired community I think is a, is a key aspect of, of this should, should be. Just yeah. to briefly point on that I mean that's um, one of the things is you know obviously we're thinking about well firstly with the ink obviously there's limited space obviously for the amount of timetables you have high frequency service and we know that now we're we're low we're just you know coming into this here at the moment but we've certainly been doing print for a long time and uh, it's a it's a challenge um i do agree with you about the could we have data please and reformat it i think that's a great idea the the problem that we have with with PDFs is obviously is that we 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 use Ments and we have a system diva there to create all of that. It's how we get those out to say a thousand, you know what I mean, and maintain those. You know what I mean. Make sure as you say if there's you know what's on that, you know what is that the right timetable on it. So we don't want to fall into that same issue where we're going like paper is the right PDF or not. You know that's just a no. That's a non-starter for us. Uh, although I see in the in, you know in the use case where it's out there, I think it's very good. It's a great way of seeing this extra information. You've got Monday to you know Monday to Friday, Saturday to Sunday. That is something that on a on a rural service you really need. You know a three line departure on a rural service is is or a mixed rural and or a uh, sorry an urban service coming into uh, a city. You know we just we would just lose those low frequency ones. No one would have any idea of the when the next bus was because there were it's mixed with a high frequency service so those are the challenges that we have in fact in 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 that so just talking about longevity i don't want to take up your time there but talking about you know the longevity and the, and the importance of scheduled information uh you know what i mean as a backup thanks sorry yeah yeah it's an, an interesting point there because certainly you know um <clears throat> again it's this business of of, of how much um, the specification here, obviously, it's about the content, what is going on to the display. Um, but the idea of kind of 
how it's displayed because you could send a series of scheduled departures and real time departures, <clears throat> which could show. Um, you know, on a, on a three line LED, the 35 is going on the half hour, the 35 is going on the hour, the 35 is going on the half hour. But actually, you're interested when the next 43 is going and that might be in an, an hour and 10 minutes. So actually, you might want to show the next service of a particular route. Now, you know, how does that because that's another aspect of, of how you show the content. So there's the, there's, the, there's the physical capability of the sign, which obviously you've got under the published by the PID, the display capability. What can you show? Is it three lines or is it 18 lines? But then the, there are other considerations as well that might be relevant, especially in that example you give now, which is a classic one, the, the, the mix of the, the high frequency and low frequency. You know, when is the next bus to a particular place? When is the next service running rather than what are the next three buses leaving this stop? It's quite a, quite a good, good point that you raised there. Yeah. OK. Thank you. Right. Um, hopefully we'll try and speed our way through this because we don't have many minutes left, do we? Um, so from the PID perspective, heartbeat we've already discussed. Display capability. This was the, the concept really of the sign being able to announce you know, these are my physical characteristics. I've got three lines. I've got 24 characters on each line. Um, if I'm a, an LED display, that sort of thing, or this is my uh, resolution if I'm a TFT display. Um, fault report, well, sort of goes without too much description what that is. System status, sensor event, that was um, really things like um, your typical um, shock sensor, temperature sensor, internal, external, those sorts of things. Um, and then the discovery um, the discovery um, is designed to be a sort of three phase process. So the PID requests, the sends a request message um, for information and then the CMS would respond and then the PID would acknowledge that it had received the response. So that that was what that was. Um, there's not a great deal of detail in the document yet that needs fleshing out. Um, and that will certainly be in the next revision um, of of the document. You'll you'll get a bit more um, flesh on that. Um, I don't know if anyone has any particular comments about those those message types that we haven't already um, touched on so far this morning. Um, if not, then we should probably just um, move on. Um, I think there's just a section on what the next steps are. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. And that's probably a good thing to discuss in our last four minutes. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think that th there's some more wider consultation for the architecture to do. There's a number of suppliers that couldn't be with us today that have got that document. We need to make sure that they're comfortable with um, the architecture um, and that they can see how they can um, implement it. Um, and then um, we'll revise that following any comments. I mean, there's been one or two here today that mean that, um, you know, we want to need to tweak that and, and tweak some of the descriptions. Um, there's more work to do on message development, um, particularly not just the what we've looked at today, which is the, the, the types, but also actually what's the detailed content in there. Um, but you know, once we once we've got consensus about the message types, you know, you need a timetable, you need a real time departure. You know, then we can bury down into the and actually this is the the message detail, um, and we'll go through consultation with that. Now, what I suggest is that um, once we've got those these core messages that we've talked about today developed um into actually this is the the content um we circulate the document with that in um have a bit of consultation and then have a review session another one of these looking at that each of them um and effectively getting some sort of you know agreement and and semi sign off for that and then we probably then at the point where actually it then goes um, out as a this is proposed version one of um, 
of this interface um and then everybody gets a chance to uh to you know to do a final review and things like that before formally publishing mustafa yeah so a uh, couple of things you're going to uh revise obviously when you do the revision is that going to include the the graphical elements in there as well or is it just still sticking with the basic text because uh, uh, looking at the spec um very briefly there, there's still elements which uh, are to be filled in but the intro is saying it's this is the first iteration which is around the basic one so the next iteration before we come back for another review will that include the graphical elements as well or not I don't know. I guess it can do if that if if that would be your preference. Um, if, if we're going to go for a version one, I, yeah. I think it'll be useful to have a version one uh, to include you know, mm -hmm. everything. Um, yeah. uh, and you know, for the next round, uh, the next review session, I think it'll be useful to maybe go through the areas where there's either need it needs more development based on feedback from the reviews themselves rather than in some cases we're having to go back in some elements and would it be also possible to share the previous mural um not not with us but yeah. anyone new coming on to the session so they can see what we've already discussed uh rather than going back and saying oh what what what, what about this what about that because we've already scoped some elements and de-scoped some elements so rather than going back and forth on some of those rather than doing it in the session we send it out in advance and that way that's when they're here they're as brief as they can be yeah yeah um, good point good point yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I'll we'll we'll once once we've done um a bit more wider consultation on the architecture um and and have made sure that um we we are confident that that is the right way to be going. Um, we'll talk to you about a date um for the next session. Um, but I'm just slightly nervous if if some of the people that aren't here today come back and go, oh no, really can't support that, um, and we have to go back. I, I'd, you know, then we would need to get back sooner than saying actually we next get together once we've done more work on on the messages and things like that. Um, and so um, we'll uh, ra rather than saying we'll do that in you know a month's time, I'd rather have a little bit more of that consultation to have some of that certainty um, before saying when that will be. But if it all goes well, then I then you know probably about three or four weeks time um, towards the end of November. Well, no, yeah, yeah, looking. Uh, I can't work out how many quite when that would be, but you know that sort of t those sort of time scales um, for for getting back with with the more content in the develop in the messages and things like that. Is that a legacy hand, Mustafa? Sorry, yeah, yes, okay. it must have been. I, I thought I'd already this. Yeah, no, I, I thought it disappeared and come back up, but. Uh, Te Teams is doing funny things at the moment, <laughs> refreshing the screen. So, OK. Um, so um, Thank you, is what I wanted to say for everybody's active participation. And it's nice. It is actually useful having new people with different perspectives coming into the conversation. So thank you all. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions on next steps? Finished. Yeah, a few minutes. Yeah. OK. Um, in which case, um, thank you all um, for participating today. Um, I'll circulate a um, link to the video. You've got the um, mural which will stay on the link um, so you can go back to it. Um, yeah, so thank you all for your time today and uh, see you soon on another call. Thank you for watching this Artig webinar. To find out more about Artig and our work, 
then please visit our website at rtig.org.uk. Thank you. Thank you.